So have you ever had a moment that left you bewildered and asking, why did I behave or react like that? Have you ever had a moment where you, you embarrassed yourself by the way that you reacted to a certain situation? What was that about? And I'm not talking about throwing cards at somebody during a game. <laughs> All in fun. You know, but the Bible has something to say about this. Remember that Esso commercial? You have a tiger in your tank? Yeah. Remember that? C.S. Lewis had another metaphor. He said, we all have rats in our cellar. Mark Twain said, everyone is like a moon. We all have a dark side. Metaphors for something that we call our sinful nature. The Bible uses terms like flesh, Romans 8, 5, and the old self, Ephesians 4, 22. Theologians kind of collectively call this original sin. That is, from one man, Adam, sin entered to the whole world, spread to all persons. That's Romans 5, 12. And consequently, along the way, each of us ratify this sinful condition by actually sinning. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we're talking about our sinful condition. You go to the doctor. Doctor, I'd like a physical. So the doctor sits you down and takes a small rubber hammer. It looks like a little wee tomahawk. And he strikes your knee, and your knee goes, boing, right? Your leg kicks out. You didn't decide to kick your leg, but it just kicked. Your body just provided an involuntary, automatic reaction to the tap on your knee. The body acted on an impulse before the impulse even reached the brain. It's called a physiological reflex. But not all reflexes are good. Because of our sinful nature, we have behavioral reflexes that are unpleasing to God and unappealing in every respect. In difficult moments, our natural reflex is to worry and to fret. Anyone here guilty of that? One honest person back there. I'm not surprised at Santa Claus. <laughs> Which is the real Santa Claus, by the way? <laughs> See, they got us covered on both parts. <laughs> in happy moments, in moments of success, of achievement, our carnal instinct is to be proud and to brag about it. In quiet moments, our natural instinct is to, is to fill the silence with noise and distraction. In painful moments, our carnal instinct is to cry out in anger, rage, and to blame. And in every moment, our natural instinct is to look up for ourselves, or as, or as Randy Bachman used to sing, I'm looking out for number one. The circumstances of our lives reveal, by our reactions, who we are at the core of our being. There's rats in the summer. There's a tiger in the tank. We all have a dark side. Now I know when we come to church on Sunday, we don't like to remind, be reminded that our hearts are deceitful, desperately sick. We want to hear about God's love, His kindness, His plans to bless us. And, and you should hear that. But you have to first uh, begin with an understanding of who we are at the core. And God does not want to leave us this way. He intends on making us into something new. <clears throat> so mark my words. God is not interested in taming the tiger. God is not interested in corralling the rats into a corner. He's not interested in leaving your dark side unexposed and untouched by light. He intends on killing the tiger, terminating the rats, and flooding the darkness with his glorious light. He wants to put to death what the Bible calls the flesh and he wants to replace the old self with what the Bible calls a new self. C.S. Lewis put it this way. A 
I've always loved this. Imagine yourself as lit as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he is doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you were not surprised. But presently, he starts to knock the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace and he intends on coming to live in it himself. C.S. Lewis was wonderful. Neat little passage. Acts chapter 4, Peter and John. They're put in jail for preaching Jesus out of the streets. The next morning they're brought before the authorities. If they weren't bold enough the night before, they're even bolder before the authorities. And they proclaim Jesus as the answer to our sinful condition. And it says in Acts 4 verse 13, And, and when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were unschooled unord or ordinary men. They were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Isn't that a great line? They took note that these men had been with Jesus. When you've been with Jesus, your behavior is going to be different than it would have been otherwise. Therefore, if anyone is Christ, Paul wrote, a new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Well, 16 years ago, I was not only uh, a new creation in Christ for many years already at that time, but I was a pastor too. I was living in Blenheim, and I would travel on Wednesday nights to play hockey in the RRHL, the famous Wichita Recreational Hockey League. Mm -hmm. I am, I was, the Holy Goal. <laughs> <laughs> As a goaltender, you get used to a little bumping around in the crease. But on this one occasion, that many years ago, while there was some bumping around in the crease, one of the players on the opposing team took his hand and put his fingers through the cage of my mask and pulled my head down so hard it pulled the helmet off my head and broke the mask so that it laid on the ice. When I looked at the referee, the referee laughed. And something happened to me. A reflex. The tiger in my tank emerged with bare teeth and claws. The rats in my cellar began to chew at the referee with a ferocity that caused him to back up fast. Mm -hmm. The player that had offended me didn't even look twice at me, just skated to the penalty box, wanted nothing to do with me. And afterwards I wondered to myself, where did that come from? I arrived at two answers. The conditions of my personal life at that time were very raw and difficult. And you know sometimes when things are difficult you suppress your emotions when they're just beneath the surface. But the second thing, and the most important thing, is I hadn't been with Jesus for a while. The circumstances of my life were dominating my attention. And so in those circumstances of the hockey game, my behavioral reflexes were completely ungodly. Now I know positionally God has called me a new creation, but I had not been allowing him to grow me in what he had called me to be. I had not been spending time with Jesus. The tiger, the rats, the darkness, the flesh, the old man, my sinful nature was being given an opportunity to spit and chew. Now am I the only one who's ever had a moment like that? For all of us, our spiritual maturity is revealed by how we react to the circumstances presented in our lives. I scribbled in my journal, Psalm 16, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. 
I have set the Lord always before me. And beside it I wrote these words. In every moment, seek God. In difficult moments, thank God. In happy moments, praise God. In quiet moments, worship God. In painful moments, trust God. These are reactions. And the circumstances of our lives are a litmus test for knowing whether we've been with Jesus and whether we are growing into the new creation that God has called us to become. So let's break it down. The goal is to always keep the Lord before you. So in every moment, at home, at work, at play, ideally, ultimately, we should be asking, where is God? What is God doing? And what is God saying? The ancient Celtic prayer captures this. God to enfold me. God to surround me. God in my speaking. God in my thinking. God in my sleeping. God in my waking. God in my watching. God in my hoping. God in my life. God in my lips. God in my soul. God in my heart. God in my sufficing. God in my slumber. God in my ever-living soul. And God in my eternity. God in everything. We look at life, or we ought to, through a God lens, so that we can become the new creation that God wants us to be. Because without God, we'll see darkness, we'll see meaningless, we'll see hopelessness. But when we look at life through God, we see light, although Paul says, albeit dimly. We see meaning, and we see hope. Now, Van Morrison, who came to faith in the early 19 or mid 1980s, anybody familiar with Van the Man Morrison, the musician? Um, one of my favorites. He came to faith in the mid 1980s. He wrote a song. Here's the lyric: You brought it to my attention that everything was made in God. Down through the centuries of eight great writings and paintings, everything lives in God. Seen through architecture of great cathedrals, down through the history of time, is and was in the beginning and ever, short, ever more shall be. When will I ever learn to live in God? When will I ever learn? He gives me everything I need. And more, when will I ever learn? You see, in the midst of tragedy, unexpected loss, the God lens reminds us that our existence is not about the here and now. It's ultimately about preparing for eternity. When bad things happen in our world, to us, the God lens reminds us of providence and that God can, can take that which is evil and bring something good out of it. And so Paul instructed us to pray without ceasing. And what he meant by that is to walk in the ever-present awareness that God is there, God is at work, God is at speaking, and for you to be looking, you to be sensitive, God all the time. I have always set the Lord before me. That's quite an ambition, isn't it? But what a beautiful life. Now, if you are doing this, if in every moment you are seeking God, then in difficult moments, your new reflex will be to pray with thanksgiving to God. So, Pastor, you mean to tell me that when someone is rude to me, someone has betrayed me, someone has manipulated me, or when my car has been scratched in the parking lot, or when I've lost my cell phone, I should pray to you with thanksgiving? That's nuts. Not normal. It's not. Normal is to worry, to fret, to get all out of sorts of things. But God is creating to us to live as new creatures by a new normal. Instead of worry and panic, we are to do as Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. Hold it. Shouldn't we pray and then give thanks when we have the answer. That, that's what we think, right? We're supposed to pray with thanksgiving. Because when we make a request, and listen close to this, when we make a request, 
God always gives us what we would have asked for if we knew everything He knows. Did you catch that? God always gives us what we would have asked for if we knew everything He knows. So pray with thanksgiving. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's a way of setting the Lord before us. So in every moment, seek God, and if you're doing this in difficult moments, you will pray with thanksgiving. But now in happy moments, your new reflex will be to praise God. Let me ask you this. What do Mel Gibson, Tom Hanks, Cuba Gooding Jr., Denzel Washington, Jennifer Hudson all have in common? They are those. They are among those who at the Oscars who won and first gave thanks to God. Aren't you glad we have kids in this church? Mm -hmm. yeah. We might have to build a new church sooner than later because it sounds like it's coming down. But it's awesome. I love it. If we reference all the Academy Awards up to the 87th one, which was, I think, around 2015, they've measured who received the most thanks. Steven Spielberg came in at number one. Harvey Weinstein, if you can believe this, came in at number two. James Cameron, George Lucas, Peter Jackson next. And God comes in at number six. 19 mentions. Now maybe you've watched a football game and you see when they receive a pass and they have a touchdown, they point towards heaven. You know, or a baseball player has a home run and he points towards heaven. You can mock that if you want, but it is a sign that a person is growing in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our first impulse when there's success or something to rejoice about is to acknowledge the one from whom all blessings now, it would be kind of fun, I just started imagining this, that every time they threw the football and they fumbled it, if they got down and gave thanks. Or every time they struck out, they went, in everything give thanks. But nevertheless, instead of puffing our chest, patting ourselves on the back, telling the world how wonderful we are, our first reflex should be to thank God. In moments of promotion, when your child is born, obtaining something you wanted, Instead of exchanging high fives like we did it, our first reflex should be to acknowledge the source from which every good gift comes. It's a reflex of setting the Lord before us. So in every moment we seek God, and if we're doing this, our new reflex in happy moments will be to praise God, in difficult moments to thank God as we pray. But what about quiet moments? What will your reflex be in quiet moments? It ought to be to worship God. We live in a noisy world. Everyone is messaging for our attention. TV, radio, computer, cell phone, tablets, advertisements. And the volume for commercials on the telly is, is always louder than the regular programming. Signage is everywhere, flashing it in bold fonts. And so that when there's a moment of quiet, we almost don't know what to do with ourselves. So our reflex is to reach for a dial, to fill in the void to create some noise. If we always have our eyes on the Lord, there should be a new reflex, and that's to worship God. In fact, God wants you to turn it off, to be proactive, not to make Him compete for your attention all the time. To be still and to know that He is God. Or as Lamentations, Jeremiah said in chapter 3, let Him sit alone in silence. One more reflex. In painful, in painful moments, our new reflex should be to trust God. When you receive a concerning diagnosis, when your children make decisions that steer them down a dangerous road, when you lose a loved one and you're filled with questions about why, when you're fired from a job or when your dream is deferred and you feel sick in your heart. Proverbs 3 verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. This is hard. It's 
Stephen Curtis Chapman, his wife Mary Beth, a number of years ago now, suffered the loss of one of their little children. She ran out into the driveway to meet her brother as he was coming home, but as he turned into the driveway in his SUV, he didn't see her and ran over her. Stephen Curtis Chapman describes the grief of losing a child as unfixable, a broken beyond repair situation until heaven. In heaven and only in heaven, he says, will this make sense? It sure didn't, and it still doesn't make sense. But I know this, God has not abandoned me. For those that keep the Lord before them, God becomes their North Star. Everything in their life is measured against the reality and the love and the hope of God. God is our cause. And there's no other way to live our lives but to trust Him in the here and now and forever. And so we want our reflexes to be different. There's a tiger in our tank. There's rats, rats in our cellar. We have a dark side. We're all like a moon. The Bible uses metaphors of our sinful nature, calling it the flesh or old self. But God calls us new creatures. And he calls us to react to life circumstances differently than we would otherwise. And this is the goal, to trust God in everything. I keep the Lord always before me. Psalm 16, verse 8. Philippians 4, 4, verse 8 and 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And may the God of peace be with you. Lord, help us to be what he's called us to be. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us knowledge. And that upon that knowledge, understanding that you don't want us to react the way we would naturally react according to our <coughs> carnal nature, but you've called us to rise above, and you would be the one that lifts us above to the degree that we spend time with you. Help us, God, to have godly reflexes going forward, and to know by experience what it means to be a joyful person who's walking with you every step of the way. I ask this in your name. Amen.